uh, in inspections of the services. And until they finish building the new Bay Bridge, uh, we have a seismically uh, challenged facility. Did you want to say something, Genevieve? I did. That's okay. In, in that vein, I just I wanted to touch on this from when my colleague Bill was speaking uh, in terms of planning for a disaster, which is not something that we like to, to do. Um, you know, in our area, I don't know that I think we do enough of that, which, which is the point I wanted to make uh, to some extent, uh, you know, that I disagree um, in that it's not enough to say that the water is here because or the water is just here because if we haven't nurtured our ferry system and something goes wrong on our bridges or tunnels you know we're going to be looking out there saying water's there haven't used it well enough and and I think that it's it's critically important that the the person that asked the question spoke specifically to the bay area but I I felt compelled to touch on the fact that we here as managers of the system have to think in those terms as well and, and nurture that system in that regard. Okay. Um, moving on to the next one. This question asks, for ferries to be effective, they need to integrate with subways. Should not the Midtown Ferry Terminal be connected to a new 41st Street and 11th Avenue subway stop? And uh, Bill, do you want to? Oh, oh, the Pier 79, right, right. Um, yeah, I think that it should be easier to, to uh, uh, integrate the two. Picking up on something Madeline was saying earlier, why, why shouldn't it be easier to uh, transfer? And then I guess at some point it'll be, well, should there be a free transfer for, for ferry customers? Um, you know, it's always about money. Uh, connectivity, as planners, we can we do a pretty good job for, in terms of getting you from point to point, and uh, it comes back to, um, you know, a way to finance it. And uh, I've been in a lot of ferry meetings over the years, and they talk about slippery slope. Well, if we do this, then what happens? And after that, what happens to our transit funding? And our colleagues from San Francisco were talking about that earlier. So, but going back to something Madeline was saying, you know, maybe there, maybe there should be a different set of authorities or one authority in the region, but I, I think the goal of her remark, and makes a lot of sense, is that um, there has to be some entity that, that, that steps way back and looks in from on top and says, well, you know, it, re it really doesn't make sense for a customer who lands at the shoreline and is a commuter not to be able to transfer quickly to a bus or a subway and have information on how to do that and so forth. So I think it's all a matter of institutional will, but there's no reason that it can't be done. Okay. Since we have an existing municipal ferry operation, why can't it be expanded to the outer boroughs in New York City? Um, does anybody want to take that one? <laughs> yes, there's a theme here. It's called money. Um, now, but, but to, to be perfectly honest, we, we looked at what it would take to go uh, further and farther. And what we determined is, the way you run a commuter line is to go to where people go to work most often, and that is in Midtown and at Wall Street. In the future, hopefully there'll be uh, central business districts that will start really blooming in Long Island City and Jamaica and downtown Brooklyn, and it will be more worthwhile to look at those in the future. But for now, it's 34th Street and it's uh, Pier 11. And the further you go, if you want to keep your headways down, you have to add a boat to go farther. So the further you go, if you keep 20 minute headways, you have to go add a fourth boat, then add a fifth boat, and you look at it, it's about a million dollars to add a boat. Just think of it that way. So then if you're going to the Bronx or to Astoria, the subsidy that you need is in the 20-ish dollar range per, per, per ride. And that's besides whatever a person is going to pay. 
If you go to Staten Island, it goes up to $35, $40 a person in a subsidy. So you have to think, you know, you, when you're using public funds, does this make sense? What else can I be using this money for? And so you have to look, how does this compare to other public transportation? And when you reach that threshold and you've crossed it, um, you have to bring it back in. So it would be wonderful to be able to have ferry service further away, but right now we don't have um, a mechanism to make that happen without spending a very large fortune. Thanks. Um, uh, I would have to say that most of the questions are going to be the, the, that I still have uh, are very similar in nature. Um, this next one, maybe we can expand it to maybe talk about, uh, Madeline just talked about the, you know, the subsidy needed for some of these, the, the, these services. Maybe we can open it up to what might be some sources of funding. Uh, but let me read the question. The question is, there's been a great mention of passenger load sharing to promote uh, more waterway usage. Is this age where multiple transit networks are, are having budgetary issues? How do you propose supplementing these insufficiencies when adding additional services? So I don't know if anybody wanted to talk about that. I, I take that as being, you know, is there money out there for operating subsidies? <laughs> might be a question for the audience as well. Is somebody, um, are there some people who might want to uh, take a, a swipe at that one. I'll take it again, but you know, I don't have anything uh, really more to add. I mean, there's some federal money, and it's already divided in the region, and everybody would like more of it, but there is no more to have. So uh, there's 5307 monies, 5309 monies, and yet uh, New York gets a certain sh share. And you know, the Stat, uh, Staten Island Ferry gets some, the Port Authority gets some, the MTA gets some, but there's no more. So, no federal money to the port. You don't get the, any, I uh, see, I'm wrong about that. No federal money to the port. I just learned something. <laughs> but, uh, so the state and city agencies share in that, and, but they're, but it, it's capped. So we don't have any other ways of uh, really looking at it unless you start looking at real estate solutions, um, tax incremental financing, sales tax, I mean there's th those, but then uh, we're not in an uh, environment right now that people are looking at raising taxes. Uh, that could happen someday, but right now that's not what's being looked at. Those are really the obvious ways and the obvious solutions right now. But then again, the one th last thing I want to talk about is just efficiencies again. If everybody looked at their agencies and saw what we all did and what we mimicked and where we might find some efficiencies, uh, there could be some money saved down, down the line. I have, would have no idea what it is, but maybe. Okay. Um, there is a question here which uh, is specifically uh, geared towards uh, I, uh, technology, I would say. What significant innovations in ferry service are in the future? I, I, I assume that's what the person is getting at. We have, um, and so that's an interesting question because uh, you guys have looked at it for emissions. So why don't I pass it on to you? Well, I can I can talk about one technology we're looking at. Uh, I think the the, the the standard ferry seem in our neighborhood anyway seems to be the two the two hull catamarans are the most efficient means of getting around. Though addressing the question actually that uh, Madeline was addressing, looking at fur services further out, we've actually been considering hovercraft. And the British have been using them to the Isle of Wight for the last uh, 40 years. And they do make sense where one of those other hot topics comes up, dredging of contaminated sediments. If you want to avoid dredging, you've got a decent distance to go and there's no other way to get in. For the smaller service, if you have the ridership and the headways, uh, some of the an economics of hovercraft look reasonably good for 200 passenger vessels. So that's, that's one technology. Okay. Um, are, are maritime support services, specifically dry docks, equipped to handle the expansion of ferry service in New York Harbor? Janet? 
I would say the availability of dry dock and maintenance facilities or where one could be located is really um, very difficult in this region. One, you want to have your uh, fleet close by where you can fuel and where you're actually starting off, and that's not the, the uh, case in, in the harbor because there's all this waterfront development. So it really goes back to a lot of things that Roland and MWA has been saying is that you want to have the ability to live together because we want to have the ferry service and you want them to be available, but you also have to have them in your backyard fueling and you have to let them um, birth their fleet where maybe you can see it and I see nothing wrong with that. But you can't have it in, in all ways. So we have to make sure that as we move forward that we leave space for them and that we're not asking them to go too far out of the area in order to fuel and maintain their fleets. Okay, thanks a lot. And I think that's going to wrap up our, our panel. Uh, before we wrap up, I wanted to draw your attention. Students at NYU's Wagner School have been uh, doing a research project uh, under MWA and looking at how uh, some of the implementation of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the waterfront plan could look like, specifically with respect to ferry service. And there is a uh, storyboard uh, um, presentation here, uh, right to my left, that I encourage you all to look at. And uh, well, with that, it was, uh, uh, I think, a, a fascinating uh, discussion. And um, with this, I'd like to, to thank all of our panelists today for doing a great job. <laughs>